So who am I? Uh, Andrew Lemon, Principal Security Engineer here at Alias. I've been here for uh, close to two years now. I have 10 years of professional pen testing experience. 20 years of IT experience. And I'm the lead engineer for pen testing and incident response. So in this talk, basically we're gonna cover everything the time a call comes in to how we resolve it and all the war stories and tales from the trenches. So our first steps on around an incident. Okay. Okay. So getting arms around the incident. So first call, what do we do? Call comes in. Uh, even before anyone signed any paperwork or made any agreements, uh, the things I'm going to do, I'm going to go to DNS dumpster and I'm going to take the company's domain name and throw it in there and see uh, what pulls up. Uh, I'm going to do port scans to see if anything's closed. Uh, I'm going to use Nessus to actually um, start doing port scans and figure out what's open and using Shodan to see historical data. All right, so DNS dumpster, uh, you can see the SPF record. That's the first thing I'm going to look at to determine if this may be a spoofing attack or what's going on. With this underscore all, that's going to cover. Oh, one second. Okay, sorry, publicly available for a network. I'm gonna have the SPF record, which is gonna include who's allowed to send mail. The underscore all will let me know if it's easily spoofed, but more importantly, I have all the IP ranges. I have the ASN so I can look up the domain and I can also see things like TCP port 80 here. So I can see 8080 is a non-standard port. Uh, it'll also may identify their multiple ISPs. Uh, Nessus scan. Most of the time, admins are going to know what led to the compromise. Maybe they made a change last week. Um, they've opened something up. Usually, there's always something, but people will try to close these holes up. So before we even engage, I'm going to start getting scans to see what might have changed. Uh, this will also help cut down on on-site time. If any possible attacks that could have been leveraged, uh, those will be identified in the NASA scan. And so usually in the event of a ransomware event or a, an attack like an APT, the first thing customers do will disconnect the firewall. And so I want to try to get ahead of that before any changes are made to the network, just so I can help find patients to zero. So that's where Shodan comes in as well. If someone's already started making changes, if the incident's been rolling along, uh, this will give me historical data as well as being able to take the ASNs and look them up. And so I can sort by like, here's an example of Dell.com. I'm able to sort by organization Dell and actually see everything that historically has been open. Uh, this will also let us quickly map the external attack surface. Uh, in maps, so I use three in maps. A uh, base in-map of just an IP range, that's going to give me a quick hit of all the open ports. In-map-sc-sb, that's going to give me the service version as well as the enumeration scripts built in in-map. So that'll tell me if I've got like Apache version 2 or Regetto, which is a, an exploitable service. Uh, In-map-p- is what I use to actually enumerate all ports, 1 through 65,000, to see if there's anything kind of hidden or misconfigured. A lot of times people will do things tricky. Uh, either their services or an attacker will open up things. So that's where the that dash p dash comes in. All right. And now here's our on site IR checklist. Uh, so I get on site. The first thing I start doing is 
asking for network diagrams. I want to know the number of sites. I want to know all, all of our possible ingress points. Uh, customers are usually based on, well, we have a site here, here, and here. For me, logically, I only care about where the network is. So once I get that those number of sites up, I start drawing on a whiteboard or a piece of paper and start getting IP ranges. Uh, a lot of people forget, oh, no, we've got a Texas office or there's a North Carolina branch. Uh, but that's where finding the DNS dumpster and all that prior hunting really helps off. So I'll go ahead and kick off external bone scans with new IP range is that maybe weren't publicly discoverable. Response process is a lot like our information gathering process on a pen test. Uh, step five is a snafu, one, I'll also with that. Uh, triage systems. So after I've started my scans and I kind of got everyone organized and I've got a plan of attack, uh, I'll actually get on the whiteboard again and say, okay, from one to 10, what's your most business critical app? And start prioritizing. Do we have a backup of that story? Have we tried that? Have we tested the backup? Do we need to start getting ransom uh, negotiated? So this will actually be able to cut prices mostly in half. Uh, but a lot of times people don't have good backups and they don't realize it until the last minute. Ah, snafu. So I, I had a problem and I needed to come up with a solution. And that's where the snafu comes in. It's secure network and forensic unit. Uh, yeah, I added LEDs to it. Uh, green for good, red for bad. Uh, what the snafu does is it solves a need. A lot of customers don't have a good firewall in place and they don't have logging and monitoring. So the back door is the, the background of snap is really easy. Um, normally the yellow cable in this diagram would run to the firewall. Instead, it goes from the core switch to our snap through now in port one. And then I run a cable from WAN one to the customer's existing firewall. This is an inline tap using transparent mode on a FortiGate that'll let me enable IPS. Uh, let me start logging and it lets me throw a span in place. A lot of customers' infrastructure doesn't have the ability to support a span, and that's where port two comes in. And port two feeds to this magical super micro server, which runs Security Onion. Uh, Security Onion is a quick hit, it's easy to install, it requires very minimal tuning. So when I'm on site, that's great. And then that little purple cable uh, is actually a secure network. So utilizing ports three through five. Uh, I create a secure network that puts me on the customer's network, but also enables IPS and will prevent me from being enumerated. So even though I have to be on the customer's network, I don't chance getting infected. Uh, Sentinel-1. Uh, I talk on Sentinel-1. Uh, the most important feature of Sentinel-1 that I use is this timeline. Show me in this example, there's a malicious Word document that spawns PowerShell that then spawns encrypted PowerShell and actually drops a shell on the machine. And you can go through and see all the files that were generated, all the actions that were created. And we also use deep visibility, which is another feature to actually hunt for IOCs. Uh, the great thing about Sentinel One is the engines it has. So it has static analysis, behavioral analysis, but one of my favorite engines is going to be the lateral movement engine. It'll actually detect calls that see lateral movement. So that's going to be. All right. So what are some of the things that we do to recover? Uh, what are we going to do in an incident? Uh, the first thing I'm going to do in an incident, uh, I'm going to enumerate the domain of Bloodhound, uh, just because I want to get away of the land. I'm going to deploy AV, and I'm going to start patching the vulnerabilities that are identified in our first set of bone scans. So Bloodhound, if you haven't used Bloodhound, it's a Windows enumeration tool. This actually helps me figure out how an attacker would move through the network. And then I can see how the actual structure is laid out. So if they've got 60 domain admins, I can know that I need to start turning those back and curtailing some of those so that we can reduce our attack surface. All right, so you think, how are we going to start deploying some of these things? Uh, I'm going to use GPO or I'm going to use SCCM. Like, well, great. Uh, Sysfall is encrypted, GP is broken, 
Uh, how are we going to push our solutions? So we need to stop this lateral movement, but how are we going to stop it? We're basically locked out of the system. Uh, PDQ deploy. They don't pay me a dime. I use their tool all the time. Uh, it's simple. I can teach an admin to use it. And in environments where patching maturity isn't where it should be, I can actually teach admins how to use this tool in 10 minutes. And now they're actively updating their systems, uh, applying patches. It's just simple. We can also set it so that it schedules a task. So as machines start coming back online, they'll start getting Sentinel-1 or whatever patch you push. I used on an engagement. Uh, had impossible time getting to machines, and this is something I use on Pentat. So anytime I've got WinRM open, uh, port 5985, and I've got username and password, I'll plug this script in. Uh, it's just written in Ruby. It's a quick hit. And actually, let me get an interactive PowerShell session. From there, I can import the Windows Update module and execute Windows updates from it. Unconventional patching methods. Um, these have been used on, on IR engagements more times than I care to admit. Uh, you can patch with Metasploit. So if you want to drop interpreter sessions and then drop shell and then do woo app and spawn Windows Update, you can do that. Uh, my more preferred method, instead of having 100 interpreter sessions, is actually use the exploit. And then for payloads, use generic custom and then specify custom exe, and you can assign your patch to the executable. So like when eternal blue is hit, it'll actually patch the system against it. And then if you run the exploit against the slash 24 again, and you get no hits this time, now you know your patch is successful. Um, here's a similar patch. It's actually the worm. So this will go out and install the specific KB for eternal blue uh, to block against it. I've used something similar with an SMB worm, but I just noticed this on GitHub the other it's a kind of an interesting approach. It's about three years too late, but still awesome that someone went through all that effort. So pitfall. Uh, don't operate like they used to. So used to an attacker would get in, they'd ransomware an environment, and they were gone. WannaCry is an example of that, where it just kind of worms through. Now attackers actually have like full-blown APTs, where we're seeing C2. One of the first things I've seen in an innumerable number of engagements is the attackers change the domain and add them. your IR. And this is where ALIS differs from most incident response teams. Because we are security engineers first and foremost and pen testers, we're going to treat it like attacker versus attacker instead of attacker versus defender. Not looking just to stop the bleeding. It's where an attacker was pivoting through the network, they had changed service account passwords. What am I going to do? Uh, I'm going to run responder because I'm going to start looking. For, believe it or not, we're able to catch through the hash. Uh, we've got a nice crack at the office with uh, two GTS 1050s. So we're able to actually pull the hash back and grab those credentials. Zero log on. So we had an issue where this exploit was used. Uh, they left it as zeros. Um, we went ahead and fired the exploit again and actually took back the domain controller. So zero logon was, uh, I believe, in 2020. Uh, There's an exploit that actually changed the password on all your DCs to 0000. zero, 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 zero. And this actually let us take back the DC. This slide is so understated for the actual amount of work that was done and actually ended up being really cool. I wish I had like a cool infographic or a gift to show off like explosions or uh, we actually stole back the domain. So the domain controller, uh, the password was changed. It was the primary domain controller. They didn't encrypt it. So we yanked it out. We pulled a forensic image of it. Uh, from that image, with EO1, we converted it to a VM. We booted it to Linux. We changed the sticky keys to cmd.exe, the old trick from uh, XP, apparently still works. Uh, hit shift five times to pop command prompts. 
fired up a new admin user uh, or created a, a new password for the administrator, rebooted, uh, logged in as the local admin, fired up the MMC snap in, changed the domain admin password for the entire uh, domain. And then when we were able to bring that back in the network, because that uh, that PDC was just the whole anything or lose anything they didn't have her as the primary domain controller and that admin password replicated okay, through it. Uh, hacking back, uh, hypothetically, I definitely do not encourage this, but there are instances where this could happen. So with attackers acting like APTs and behaving like hands on the keyboard, um, what can we do? If we know where their servers are coming from, we can block them. We can block C2, we can block malware serving, but you could take it a step further. And if they, for instance, were using vulnerability level micro tick routers, uh, you could fire exploits that just dump the whole config and took the systems offline. So reversing TrickBot. TrickBot is a full loader uh, that allows you to maintain persistence. Uh, this is an instance of on a client site, we came across TrickBot. And if you come to our B-Sides training, we'll actually go into decoding and breaking this, but basically brute force the string. And now the attackers are nice enough to give us all their command and control IPs along with the ports. Um, these went offline the next day. I know, don't know what happened, but they were no longer available to maintain that persistence. And that was one way of making sure that our client was good. Uh, default SSH key. So the first thing you should do when you spin up a version of Kali is regenerate your SSH keys. A lot of attackers don't realize that this is bad. And if they've connected through VPN and I see a DHCP request on Kali, I might try the default SSH keys. I may have a copy of five or six of them. And this may be an instance of getting on an attacker's computer and what you can do from there. Uh, maybe RM-RF or uh, start killing them interpreter sessions. It's honestly more fun to kill their interpreter sessions and cause them frustration than it would be just to stop them. Again, hypothetically, um, of course. Uh, SAR remediation and cleanup. Uh, our most recent problem we've been dealing with is Hafni and then all the exchange exploits. Uh, we're finding websites and uh, users' environments just littered with web shells. And it's honestly really hard to track them down. Um, a web shell basically will give you a full interactive session in like a PHP script. This is C99 shell. China Chopper is the one that we were seeing with Hafnium. Um, we actually ran across it as it was a zero day. So back in February, we were finding web shells distributed across all these exchange subdomains, and we couldn't figure out uh, what was going on, how are these being triggered. Uh, so some of the steps that I took was going through IAS logs, looking for changes. Durbuster is another good tool to use. It'll actually do directory brute forcing, and you can hunt down and see if you can find the shells. Ultimately, though, the, the persistence was too great. They were too widespread. And there's just too much. Instead of playing whack-a-mole and trying to knock these things out, uh, we ended up nuking and paving most of our environments that we dealt with in terms of walking our customers through how to back up Exchange, uh, rebuilding Exchange, maybe upgrading to 2019, applying patches, and then assisting them with importing all their mailboxes. Coating. So this is... Uh, Coedic has all these mechanisms of persistence where it's going to either apply a, uh, a scheduled task, uh, it's going to use Mishta on startup, so you can see that this stager is a JavaScript stager uh, using MSTA, and so we'll have to actually go out and hunt these things. Uh, here's an example of a hunt script actually written by one of our engineers, uh, applied Python. They converted all the machines using data compromise, LC26 EXE, 80 find EXE, HP support.exe, 
Kuwait was hiding in the public music users folder, which is a strange place for it. But we actually had to go out and hunt the registry. Uh, through the GitHub, we're able to find the IOCs and all these mechanisms, reverse that and figure out where things are stored, how it persists, and how we can remove it. So, uh, any questions? Uh, so the first good thing to do when you expect compromise is honestly get someone on the phone. If you can at least pick their brain, um, there's just any number of things. So depending on what kind of compromise, is it going to be a full-blown incident or is it going to be uh, just a, a quick maybe business email compromise? Um, so rule of thumb is reach out and talk to someone or at least start triaging. Uh, go through your steps. You should have a good incident response process. 